if we could journey back in time before musicking ever left any traces in the archaeological record, it is likely that the earliest gestures that we might recognize as proto-musical behaviors in early humans would be some form of song-like vocalizations or rhythmic beating of hands and feet. Many musical instruments developed as extensions of these two gestures. Things like beaters, sticks, and other kinds of percussive instruments are often very obvious extensions of the beating gestures, and those prehistoric flutes were in a sense extensions of the mouth, of breath, and of vocalization. All this seems fairly obvious. Now, this is where it starts to get interesting. It may be that string instruments also originated as extensions of the sound-producing abilities of the mouth, just like wind instruments. This might seem strange to us, as we're not accustomed to see a string instrument placed in the mouth in a position similar to that of a wind instrument. But this may in fact be precisely how some of the earliest string instruments were played. The first string instruments were likely in the form of a simple bow. We know from archaeological remains that the earliest harps, for example, were variations on the classic bow design. In origin, these musical bows were likely indistinguishable in appearance from the bows used for archery, and may even have been the exact same bows. We have a number of similar musical instruments still existing today, centering most commonly around Africa, which are loosely grouped under the term mouth bow, precisely because they are played by placing one end of the bow in the mouth or with the mouth in proximity of the bow string. The string is then plucked or more often beaten rhythmically with a thin stick, almost the same size as an arrow shaft, in fact. As many of these instruments are beaten rather than plucked, then it might be better to say that these early string instruments were a combination of the vocalizing gesture and the beating gesture. The way these are played produces a sort of rhythmic drone and the mouth is used as a resonating chamber. Changing the shape of the mouth varies the tonal contours of the drone. Now, it's hard to say how long the technology of the bow has been around for, as bows, again, are made of perishable materials. But from the archaeological evidence of potential arrowheads, some speculate even as far back as 100,000 years ago or more. The oldest bow we have is about 18,000 years old. Either way, it would be almost impossible to determine from the remains of bows whether any were used for musicking. Bows have many possible uses, and even today, the San people of the Kalahari are known to convert hunting bows to musical bows, so one use does not exclude the other. We do, however, have a very mysterious image engraved on the walls of the Trafrer cave, dating back 13,000 years, which appears to show a man wearing a full bison hide, including the head, almost like some form of camouflage, standing in the middle of a moving, sprawling mass of herd animals, holding up to his face what appears to be a bow. Now, if you think back to what we said about the way in which Blackfoot hunters used musicking during the hunt. 
then you can understand why this figure is interpreted as potentially being a magician hunter of some sort with a musical bow. And the idea that something like the mouth bow would have been one of the earliest forms of string instrument makes a lot of sense. Even many contemporary string instruments are in a sense a development of this bow and mouth combination. Imagine beating a basic bow without placing it in the mouth. It would make a bit of sound, but not much. By placing it in the mouth, this turns the oral cavity and the whole head, in fact, into a resonator. The next step, then, in the evolution of string instruments would be to attach a resonating body of some sort to the bow, just as a modern guitar or zither or violin also has a hollow body with the hole somewhere in proximity of the strings, performing the same function as the opening of the mouth did. We find the earliest examples of string instruments with resonators during antiquity, but there were likely older instances. We even still see today examples of what the earliest bow and resonator designs would likely have looked like. Just something like a simple gourd attached to the wooden staff of the bow. The example of this design that Westerners are most familiar with is likely the berimbau, used in capoeira. Now, interestingly, these very simple and likely earliest bow and resonator designs tend to have the hole placed on the back of the gourd, facing away from the string. And this may seem strange at first, until you see that in a number of traditions, players will hold the bow so that this hole on the resonator is pressed against the flat of the belly, meaning that by moving the bow while playing, they can open and close the hole, creating the same undulating variations in timbre that were originally created by opening and closing the mouth as we can hear in this amazing example from Zambia of a one-stringed bow and resonator instrument known as the kalumbu. As with all the other incredible examples of musicking in this video, you can find links to that in the description. Now, once string instruments were given their own mouths and bodies, the link with the human vocal cavity could be severed, and string instruments would come to be played in a manner that we are more familiar with today. <laughs> 